I'm Anne-Marie Pearman and I'm joined today by Grace Kelly. Um, Grace used to be a teacher in London. She's an Irish native, um, for those who don't know her, and she lives currently in Italy. Um, she's a coach. She's built a successful coaching business since being a teacher. And um, she sadly um, lost her fiancé um, nine months ago. And as the theme of this is Remap Your Life, she wants to focus on talking about how to deal with loss and her own personal experience and how she's finding having to cope and, um, you know, she lost everything she knew and how to move forward with that. So I'll pass you over to Grace. Oh, thank you, Anne-Marie. It's lo lovely to be here. And I, I love that we're talking about remapping our lives at a very um, poignant time. I always think that September, at least for me, maybe as a former school teacher, September always felt like um, the month or, uh, you know, the beginning of the months where we could start to call in change rather than January. So it's no surprise that the 30th of September today, we're just on time to, to really explore remapping our lives. And um, Yes, I've remapped my life a few times, you know, as you mentioned in the introduction, as a school teacher in London, I was just very dissatisfied with my work life. I, you know, I loved the kids. I loved being able to um, share knowledge, but uh, there was an inner yearning, an inner calling to be of service in a new way. And interestingly, I didn't know what that would look like. And I think that's one of the first things I want to share with people is like you really don't need to know the exact thing that you want to do next. You really don't need to know what the new map is going to look like. I had no idea that I would go on to move countries, set up a coaching business, travel the world, now host clients on retreat here. I had no idea. And in fact, if I had been the one to come up with what I was going to do next, I don't think I'd have given myself permission to do something quite as courageous as that, something quite as glamorous as that. I probably, in my mind, would have come up with just another job in London. And so I think when we talk about remapping our lives, we, we really want to be gentle with ourselves. You don't have to have it all mapped out. But what's very helpful is that you listen to that inner call. I use the term wisdom. Some people use the term clarity. Um, some of you might use the term desires. And that inner call generally isn't the entire plan. That inner call is generally what's, what's pulling me forward? What's next? And so for me back then as a teacher, it was, oh God, I want to do something other than this. <laughs> I want to have something a lot more um, expansive and enjoyable than this. And so again, you know, that's one of the first things you want to take into consideration when we're, when we're remapping our life. Uh, beyond that kind of initial experience with my um, career and changing over to become a coach and then beginning to travel the world, seeing clients all over and then moving forward to bringing clients to Italy. Beyond that, obviously, I've been faced now with a whole new remapping of my life. And that new remapping has come through not a desire, but actually something unwanted, the death of my fiance very suddenly back in December. And so I find myself again in this place where I'm navigating the unknown, but I'm feeling a lot of trust uh, regardless of an uncertain direction. And so this is the second point I want to make for people is, you know, when we're remapping our lives, there is a level of uncertainty and unknown that is very, very helpful. Um, there's a level of uh, the unknown and, and de delving into it that we have to embrace if we want to have a new life, if we want to move forward. And sometimes, like in the case of the death of Francesco, it's an unwanted 
um, situation where you're forced into a remapping. And what I notice about myself in this period of time, Anne-Marie, is just um, there's a lack of fear. And that, that really surprises me, that in the face of such loss, um, that, that, that we can have loss and we can have uncertainty, but that the fear is optional. You know, freaking out is optional. Um, getting yourself in a spin and a tizzy about it and, you know, screaming and kicking, wanting the past to be back again is optional. And I find that when I work with clients, the less they're in that experience of scaring themselves with their thinking, the more they're able to remap their lives and navigate the unknown with a certain level of grace, a certain graceful transition and movement, a, a dance almost. And it's not to take away from the terrible experiences that people are having today, whether they're losing jobs or losing loved ones or losing income, it's just to say that putting a gun to our head about the situation is something that we have learned to do, but it's completely optional. It does not help you remap. Now, many people listening are probably saying, yes, Grace, I, I know that I, I do that and I know it's not helpful, but I can't help it. Well, it's human nature, right? But the more we start catching ourselves, putting the gun to our head, scaring ourselves about the future, scaring ourselves about the change we need to make, um, the more we catch that, and we often catch it through how we feel, Anne-Marie, the more we catch that, the less inclined we are to be seduced by it. Is this making sense at all? I just love to check in rather than keep babbling on. <laughs> yes, it is, yeah, yeah. 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 So I think people have kind of innocently learned and me too, you know, innocently learned. Um, if I scare myself enough, then I'll make a change. If I if I worry enough, then things will be different. You know, then somehow everything that needs to happen will happen more easily. And that's not the case. I, you know, we it's, it's an innocent learned habit. But it is something that we want to catch more and more as we begin to remap our lives. Um, so please feel free to question what, what you're hearing, what you'd like to pick up on. I'm great with questions. <laughs> um, the only thing that's occurs to me, and it is different, um, the only thing I've had can experience that was similar to what you experienced is that I lost my father at a relatively young age, very suddenly. Um, he was an older father who's a lot older than my mother. And I did go into a bit of a downward spiral and I was an only child and I ended up in a relationship for longer than I should have as a result of that, or I put it as a result of that. This is before I knew about the three principles. So how do you, from your experience, and I don't know what other experience you've had of bereavement, how, how, do you, how do you feel that you could keep on track when you're in the midst of grief, mentally? That's a beautiful question. Well, I guess what I have seen throughout this period of time is that the more I allow the experience, whether it's the sadness or the regret or the worry about the future, the more I sort of allow the experience to flow through, the less I get stuck there. Now, one of the things that really surprised me, Anne-Marie, is the fact that we can have grief without extra layers of suffering. That really shocked me because, you see, I thought um, that I you know, the world was just going to come crashing down completely and I was never going to be able to pick myself up off the floor. And those extra layers of suffering, which I've mentioned earlier, scaring ourselves, worrying too much, living in feelings of regret, living in feelings of what if, those levels of suffering tend to leave us worse off than we need to be. 
you know, again, they're optional. And as we allow the experience of loss to occur, we, as we allow the feelings to come and go, and as Sydney Banks, for those of you familiar with the three principles, as Sydney Banks said, if the only thing we ever learn is not to be afraid of our experience, that alone would change the world. As we allow those feelings to come and go without layers of being afraid, interestingly, they pass on. And I really saw something deeply about the role of state of mind where grief and loss is concerned. I began to see or track, as you use that that word, Anne-Marie, I began to track that my experience of loss was so much heavier when I was in a low state of mind, when I was tired, when I was hadn't slept well when the elevator of consciousness had just dropped down so much. And then what ultimately surprised me was the level of loving feelings I was living in, especially in the early months after the loss. Who knew that was possible? Again, my state of mind or the the level of consciousness was somewhere further up the scale in those early days and months and weeks. And so my experience of grief and loss was actually surprising to me. It wasn't scaring me, it wasn't taking me down. It, um, it wasn't stuck in a particular way. So I began, I began to get curious about this relationship between our state of mind and the grief we fall into. Um, so I just really started to, to, to get curious about this, this tracking the state of mind. And I don't mean obsessively, you know, being concerned about my state of mind, but there was something so helpful about knowing, Grace, you're tired. Of course, it feels worse. Don't listen to your thinking from this state of mind. Or Grace, you know, you're anxious. Um, allow it. I used to be someone who was always pushing the feeling of anxiety away. I was so afraid of it. And I I just began to learn to invite the feeling more um, deeply, actually just breathing into the feeling more deeply, allowed it to dissipate. So there's been a great learning curve, Anne-Marie, where feelings are concerned for me, particularly unwanted feelings, and a great learning curve around the role our state of mind um, plays and influences where our emotions are concerned, where our feelings of grief and loss are concerned. Is that helpful at all? Yes, yes, I find it helpful. Um... Has anybody, I know I've asked a question, I'm just going to open it up to see if Sharon or Wendy have got anything they'd like to ask or? Yeah, I'm, I'm open to questions if anyone has, has some. Uh, you're very welcome just, to come on. I just wanted to say what an inspiration. I kind of watched your journey from when he passed away and it was just so heartbreaking, you know, heartbreaking for me. I'm almost in tears thinking about it. And your resilience and your the way you dealt with it and listening to you now, um, if nothing can change that, so um, it's just been remarkable, um, very remarkable. And one of the things that you touched on that, that I finally have a deeper understanding of is to not be afraid of uh, my experience, even little things. I find that, and like you said, being tired, sometimes at night I have all these thoughts and I just kind of like, you're tired, just ignore it and to not, and then, and then it keeps popping in my mind what Sid said and you said about not being afraid of your experience because it's just, it doesn't get you anywhere, it's just, there's nothing to be afraid of, it will pass, it will pass. So yeah. I don't really have a question. Just I love hearing you speak, and um, I, you're just you. remarkable. It's an inspiration. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And one of the things I'd love to pick up on with that is, you know, like, I'm not the exception. I really want people to really see this, that um, we are all made from the same incredible resilience. And sometimes we just don't see it or experience it until our world is taken from, kind of the, the, the rug is taken from beneath our feet or whatever that saying is, you know? Um, if you had told me in advance, you know, your fiance is gonna die and you're not gonna be able to do this or that, you're not gonna be able to go here or there, you're not gonna, I would have been freaking out the whole time. I just wouldn't have been able to prepare myself mentally for that. But the difference now is that I've been through that experience and I've seen um, uh, human nature's true design. We are designed to be resilient. We are designed to bounce back. We are designed for the elevator of consciousness to go back up rather than to stay stuck down there in the basement. And I think as humans, we just tend to interfere a lot and we tend to worry about our feeling state. We tend to get over concerned about how we're doing in, in ourselves and life. And all of that kind of just uh, keeps us stuck on what I call, you know, the basement or the lower floors. If you can imagine, um, if you can imagine the Empire State Building, when you go to the top of the Empire State Building, right up at the top, you have this incredible view of New York City. You can see everything. You can see Central Park, the top of the Chrysler Building. You can see all the gorgeous shops. Um, our, you know, you, you have clarity up there. And it's the same with our mind as, you know, as our, if we go up the elevator of consciousness, up on those upper floors, we see life more positively, more clearly. We have access to wisdom and ideas and direction that we just don't see when we're down on the lower floors. Equally, Empire State Building, if you're just on floor two or three, you're not seeing any of that view. You're not seeing clearly. And so what I've really learned is you kind of want to be gentle with yourself, not kind of, you do want to be gentle with yourself when you're on the lower floors. Because a lot of people I'm working with expect themselves to be on the upper floors all the time or to be creating an incredible life and remapping their business and remapping their desires from a really low state. And the best we can do on a low, in a low state is get out of bed in the morning and get through the day. And then we fall into this beating ourselves up because we're not doing so great and we should be feeling better and we should be more positive. And all of this is, is our human interference. As we learn to get out of the way and let the mind bounce back to where it needs to be, let our resilient nature burst forth, we are perfectly at peace, able to remap, able to move forward. I hope that's making sense. If you want to pick up on anything, let me know. Um, but there's this, um, there's this innocent uh, uh, idea that um, we, you know, like somehow, well, she could, she's resilient, so she can cope, or she's, she's remarkable, but, but we all are. We all have this. This is, this is God's stuff inside of us. And this is the stuff that we forget we're made of until we're hit with something that rocks our world. Some, something that's just occurred to me, I'm not sure that this is a three P's question, but um, again, with my own experience of sudden loss and grief and shock, and I don't know whether it's a British thing, but a lot of people avoided talking to me, like people who I thought were friends wouldn't discuss it. Um, and conversely, people who I didn't consider were friends were sort of, you know, 
give me condolences and things. So I'm just thinking if somebody is with, if somebody is watching this now and they're concerned about somebody who's undergone gone a sudden grief process, is there anything you could say in what, how they could support them? Well, I, I read a quote from Marianne Williamson that really struck me, Anne-Marie, and she said, if all you can do is stay awake to their suffering, that's enough. And I think there's something powerful about that. You know, how, how you choose or how we choose to stay awake to someone else's suffering. Um, you know, people can see me as resilient and remarkable and be out there. And, you know, three hours ago, I was lying on the bed crying. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm here, I'm doing what I love, and my face is lit up with the inspiration of, of teaching and sharing this message. Um, but the suffering um, is still something that occurs. And, and um, you know, you, you listen for your own wisdom on that. If someone you know is out there and they, they are going through what they're going through, you know, really really let yourself stay awake to to that and it doesn't have to be words I think that's the thing that I have found to be like a gesture um you know um a gift an invitation to dinner one of the things that my friends have been brilliant at doing even though maybe not necessarily talking about uh like you said Anne-Marie you know, acknowledging verbally what's going on. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've been great at is like just making sure I'm included. So, you know, I've just had this incredible burst of community of people just making sure Grace gets invited and making sure that she's included and how can we take care of her in some way. And so I don't know that it's a British thing. I think it's a human thing. I think that, um, People are really uncomfortable with other people feeling uncomfortable, but you and I know where our feelings are coming from. And I think when people don't understand what feelings are and where they come from, they naturally want to avoid any sort of uncomfortable feeling, whether it's in themselves or it's in you. Um, so I hope that makes sense, but that's how I see it. No, that just makes sense. Yes. I just wondered what your thoughts were on it from, you know, because that was my experience and I wasn't sure whether, because I'm part Irish as well. My mum at the time was saying, oh, it's because um, it's because we're in in England. <laughs> I'm not so sure whether it is that, but, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. And listen, I, 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 you know, I think um, I think having lived in England and coming from Ireland, I think we're, we're all really good at um, just wanting to enjoy ourselves and you know let, let's get over the hardship and get on with with um with work and life and trying to try and think, think of the enjoyment that we can have um but again it goes back to that human nature it, for me at least Anne Marie, it goes back to that human innocent human nature which is you know i don't i'm a a feeling of discomfort is uncomfortable for people. And that's why part of my work is really to share this message more deeply that if you can start to sit, if you can, if you can start to see that your feelings of anxiety, stress, discomfort, grief, sorrow, loss, uncertainty, if you can start to see that those feelings are simply invitations to quieten down the, the busy mind. You stop being afraid of them. Most importantly, you stop being seduced by them. I was thinking back the other day, I had a lot of anxiety and my, my anxiety has definitely ramped up since, since I lost my partner. And I was, I was in this feeling of anxiety. It was really, really strong, like not in my stomach, no appetite, just really crunch hard, heart beating, this type of thing. The old me 
without understanding what that feeling meant would have created an entire story about her body, herself, what was going to happen in the future, what drugs she needed to go and get, or what herbal medicines she needed to go and take. And I would have created such a drama out of that feeling that the feeling would have probably lasted hours, days, weeks. The other day, Anne-Marie, I was in that feeling and I noticed it. And I also noticed I wasn't trying to fix it or get away from it. I just did the next best thing, which for me was to take my dog for a walk and go and eat ice cream in the park, you know, uh, sit in the sun. That's phenomenal. There, there's, that's freedom. To, to not be in a constant cycle of trying to feel better or fix your feeling is freedom. And for those of you that are wondering, you know, well, what does she mean? What, how is she not afraid of this anxious feeling? Well, I've come to see that very powerful, strong feelings of anxiety like that, including those palpitations and everything, are just, they're, they're, they are the physical symptom of us using our thinking in a very scary way. And there's no doubt about it. I just woke up that morning and I was scaring myself. I was probably scaring myself in my dream state. And I woke up and I was still scaring myself. And I didn't even know I was scaring myself with my thinking until my, until my heart and my anxiety started to alert me. How phenomenal is this? That the human body is designed to alert us to how ineffective we're being with our mind that the human body is ready to give us a, a palpable tangible response not uh to let us know about a terrible future to let us know where we are on the elevator of consciousness and and, and whether or not we're living with a gun to our head and most of the time we don't know we've got the gun up we don't know where we're living like this, but that feeling is there to alert us. And I just think that's the greatest news on earth. <laughs> I've got another question for you. So for those who aren't part of the Three Different Souls community, we talk about levels of consciousness quite a lot. What do you understand to mean when you talk about levels of consciousness? I think for me, and again, this isn't necessarily what Sydney Banks would say or what three principal teachers would say, or whatever. My, my personal understanding and experience of levels of consciousness is that we go up and down all day. <laughs> We're a little bit schizophrenic. <laughs> um, we, we just... It was like the other morning, I just woke up and I was in that, in that anxious state. You know, the consciousness had, had obviously dropped during the night. Now, we're, here's, here's the thing I really see about this is we are not in charge of what level of consciousness we're on in any given moment. And the biggest disservice the self-help movement has done is to suggest that we can control the level of consciousness based on just changing our thinking. Have you ever tried to change your thinking when you're in a low mood? It's, it's the hardest thing to do and it, and it doesn't last. So I think the more we can sort of get over this idea that we're in control of the thinking that comes into our mind and that we're in control of where we are on the elevator. And if we just, if we just have a better lifestyle, we'll be up the elevator more. If we get more money into our bank account, we'll be up the elevator more. It's not true. 
you know, I, I had this experience in my life where I was doing really well in my business. Um, and I just wanted to spend the money on really luxurious experiences. And I did, I, I was doing that and I did that and I loved it. And I was in this five star hotel in Beverly Hills and it was world renowned. And I was there for a couple of weeks and living the high life. And I had to change room three times because I was convinced that my, my feeling was coming from the room, that my dissatisfaction was coming from the room. And that if I just moved rooms again and again, then I'd feel better. What do you think happened? I just, you know, at, at, at some point I just gave up moving rooms. But I learned a great lesson because I learned that the external world was not dictating my mood. And this was, it was revolutionary to me because I really was convinced that if I just get things better on the outside, then I'll be better on the inside. Before I came across this understanding, to me, it just looked like a good idea to earn more and spend more and have more and do more and be more. Now, don't get me wrong. I still love five-star hotels. I still love luxurious experiences. But the difference now is I'm, I'm less and I'm more, I'm, I enjoy it more because I'm less inclined to be blaming my feeling state on the external. I'm, I'm smiling because it makes me think about how we can put emotional attachments on inanimate objects. <laughs> yeah. So I know I've done that myself in the past. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. So we've got 10 minutes left. Um, Sharon or Wendy, have you got anything else you'd like to ask Grace or Wendy? I, I... We, lo we love dogs, don't worry. <laughs> oh. But just to pick up on the, um, you know, the story we attach, Anne-Marie, to, to the objects and things, you know, again, I'm not saying here that we shouldn't, <clears throat> we shouldn't do that. You know, I have um, beautiful photographs of me and Francesco and I have things that he gave me that I, that I cherish. Um, and yet there's something so freeing about seeing that it's us that gives meaning to things. You know, when when it when it came to Francesco's funeral, I would have been quite happy to do a burial and and you know, do it that way. And but equally, I didn't I didn't have a lot of attachment or meaning to 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 what would happen. And his family wanted to do a cremation and 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 keeps keeps the ashes at the house and. Sadly, my, our, our dog passed away a month ago as well. And again, we did a cremation and they keep the they keep the ashes at the house. And a couple of times people sort of said to me, you know, well, do, well don't don't you want to have those things too? Or don't you? And and I thought about it and then it occurred to me, I just don't ha give any meaning to the remains. I give a lot of meaning to the the spiritual connection that I feel and the relationship that we had and the experience I'm having with him now in a new way. But I don't, you know, we have, we have free will where we give meaning and where we give story. And I, um, I appreciate that other people give meaning to certain objects or certain, certain situations and, and all of that. I, um, I think that's the beauty of free will and that's what makes us all different is you know we we get to make up whatever we want with our thinking we get to make up whatever we want with our thinking and when I feel insecure at times especially now that he's not with me I, I see I see I'm making up a story there 
And there's something about seeing what you're doing with your thinking that helps you play a different game. Is that making sense at all? It is. And I think Wendy's ready to ask you a question now. Yeah, sorry, I've shut the dog out. I feel a bit bad. <laughs> yeah, um, go back to the grief thing. Um, yeah, I couldn't talk at the time because of a noisy dog, but, you know, a lot of us have got one. Um, go back to the grief thing. In the past two years, uh, I uh, had four um, family deaths. Um, and I've, I've only been around um, the wonderful Sid Banks understanding for less than two years so the first couple of deaths uh were painful you know and it was not understanding what was going on the last two i saw them differently and in particular the very last one and uh it was my sister who i was very close to but uh i was fortunate to be with her at the end and um i remember in her passing looking out the window and knowing, knowing that I would be okay, yeah, um, that there was going to be some newness and that I would be okay. I knew that grief would happen. I knew it would go through me and there'd be ups and downs. Mm -hmm. But because of what I knew, I, I saw it very differently, uh, certainly to the first two, two deaths. Uh, and I'm still okay, you know. Uh, I, have, I have ups and downs, but I'm still very, very much uh okay uh the the last one um unfortunately she, she she died from covid but i will say this and i hope it's okay to share it the second thing on her death certificate was catatonic depression and that was because she'd been isolated because of covid and uh i knew i remember thinking you know that even with that there was there would have still been a way out even with such deep depression unfortunately covid uh, got in the way i wasn't allowed to visit her she wouldn't pick up the phone and, and it is what it is but just my learning from that was that even with such a very deep labeled depression that i knew if i could have connected with her but she could have got out of that. I felt that quite strongly. Um, and, and yeah, coming away from, from that, um, uh, the other thing is I work in education and I know that you used to work in education, um, Grace. Um, and I work in teaching support with young students. And uh, because of this wonderful understanding, I see every day, I did with a student today who... Um, who I was with for a couple of hours and she came in, she had her hoodie on and she wasn't in a good space, you know, and uh, we sat and did some work together one-to-one. -to -one, and um, I was telling her that, you know, it, she's, it, it, she wouldn't be like that all day. Oh, I will, I will, I will. And, uh, you know, I just said, said a, a, a few words, you know, I'm not highly skilled in sharing Sid's understanding. I just listen and I'm just there. And uh, she did come out of it, whatever I was saying, some of it was, was good. And uh, it was after over an hour, you know, there was a smile. And at the end of the day, you know, I sort of revisited that chat with her, you know, that she thought that she would be like that all day long. And I just wanted her to see the difference, you know, that up and down, just that simple conversation, up and down emotions. And uh, a couple of other kids listened in, which was great. Um, do you, do you, do you, uh, do you, or have you worked in education or supported students with the under, with their, their feelings and thoughts? No, I haven't. Not yet. I've mostly been working with um, with adults and yeah, women and coaches and teachers, teachers and trainers. But yeah. I, th I think I, I think the er the earlier people can get this, the more graceful their life will be. So I, I do look forward to the day that I could could help uh, help the younger ones too. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. And you've done 
you've done some wonderful work with uh, Mavis Khan. I just um, uh, signed up to your website and I've got the first two listening um, uh, videos sent to me up, which are on only t today, actually. So I, I will listen to them and enjoy them very much because Mavis is wonderful as you are too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful, Anne-Marie. Good. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking, because um, Wendy mentioned Mavis Khan thing, I can put a link on YouTube when I put this on YouTube. So um, I'll just make a note for myself so I don't forget. Um, link to, yeah, because I've seen that as well. I just sort of forgot about it when um, until Wendy just mentioned it. Um, so, and it's near the top of the hour. It's one minute to the top of the hour. <laughs> so it's lovely talking to you. I know you have to go now. Yes, I have. There's a, I've been invited to a fashion show and a Very gala nice. dinner. Nice. So, I'm jealous at all. <laughs> I'm on my way out to that now. But this is lovely. Thank you. And, Thank you, um, Grace. The, Thank you. Uh, you'll, have, you'll have my website anyway, Anne-Marie, yeah. if people want to check it out. I have a... I have a um, quite a, a good blog uh, okay. there over the last nine months, my okay. whole journey through, from Francesco's death to now. Okay. So you get lots of reading there if you're interested. Yeah, so I'll put that link on to on the YouTube posting as well. Okay. okay Thank you then. so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.